Okay, how are you guys doing? Good, good day so far. I am super excited to be here. Do we have any, uh, anybody who likes the Douglas Adams trilogy, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah? Sass that hoopy Ford Prefect. There's a girl that really knows where a towel is. It's great to be here talking about the future of transportation, the future of flying cars. And it's an industry that I know well, yet interestingly enough, I used to talk to people in keynote speeches about flying cars in the early 90s, and just like many of the innovators and the inventors here this weekend, people would laugh at me and ridicule me and tell me I was off the charts crazy. We will never fly flying cars in our lifetimes. I'm here to tell you that that is not the case, that next year you will see the very first commercial flying cars in the marketplace. And that is a really cool concept. So let me give you a bit of a background as to how I got involved in the flying car marketplace. Several years ago, I actually led a team on a Guinness World Record in Australia. And so we took paramotors, so a foot-launched paraglider with a motor on our back, and we flew 8,500 kilometers and we set a Guinness World Record. And so I thought, well, I've got to do, and I did that for charity. My wife and I have a charity, so I was doing that for charity. And I thought, let me see if I can be the first guy ever to fly a gyroplane around the world. And somebody told me to go look at Pal-V. It was a company that I knew nothing about at all. And when I looked, they had this super cool gyroplane that also would drive on the road. It was a flying car. So I called them, I called the, the offices in the Netherlands, and I said, you need to give me two of your flying cars, and I am gonna make you so ridiculously famous by flying one around the world, that's it. Your marketing is done. And they looked at me on the phone and they said, no thanks because they're Dutch. And I apologize if I offended any Dutch people in the room, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. They said, we don't think so, but maybe. Well, it just so happens my business partner is Dutch, and so I said, why don't you guys talk, because you can use your native language and you can chat, and here we are now running the Americas for Pal-V. So it's a totally exciting place to be in actual fact, and one that I love. And I think the whole industry is driven by the, the movies that we've seen to a large extent. Maybe it's the Douglas Adams movie, maybe it's Fifth Element, or the Harrison Ford movies years ago, Blade Runner, that kind of stuff, where we really want to envision flying cars. And so the media is eating up every media release that comes out and talking to us about another flying car in the marketplace. Here is Douglas Adams' quote, I love it. It's all about launching yourself at the ground and missing. That's really what flying is all about. And I wanna tell you a bit more about my personal experience with a flying car. And this actually was a few years ago at a rally. I love rally driving, that's my car there after they pulled it out of the ditch. And uh, what actually happened, it was a winter rally that I was winning and my co-driver made a small error in the notes. And so I came over a crest at 110 kilometers an hour and it was 30 meters before a cliff on ice. So I managed to turn the car around backwards, put it in second gear, try and drive away, and all I succeeded in doing is giving ourselves a much more exciting ride than I would have otherwise had because we went over a cliff backwards at about 100 kilometers an hour. So I was probably one of the first people to fly a flying car, truly, and after they pulled me out of the ditch, I carried on and, uh, and sadly they damaged the car a bit more pulling out of the ditch, so we had to finish the race, we were done. But that really was my first introduction to the flying car until I met Pal-V. And I think at the moment when we start to see all of the media releases that are happening and all of the articles that are coming out, there is no question that it's very confusing to sort out one technology from another. And my goal today is to really quickly, in the next 12 minutes, I wanna share with you the difference between invention and innovation. And I wanna talk about how one creates commercial success. So let me first of all talk about the, the types of vehicles that are in the marketplace today and see if we can put some context to that. On, if we look at the chart, on the right hand, oh, sorry, on the left hand side of the chart, what you're gonna see is the PAL-V. That's the vehicle that we're gonna to introduce to the marketplace in the next 12 months. It's fully compliant with all of the regulations. You just need a driver's license and a pilot's license. So from a simplistic point of view, it's about as simple as we could get. As we move to the right hand side, what you're gonna see is some vehicles that don't fully comply with regulations. So those are gonna to need to work with the regulators and get some relaxations to introduce their vehicles. That 
is a risk that for us in the commercial world is too difficult. A government is not likely to give you a timeline on when they may change regulations. So we took the approach of designing within regulations. As we move further to the right, what we're seeing is concept vehicles that are far from proven. And that's, they're referred to in the media as flying cars. In actual fact, the industry itself is calling them EV tolls. So electrical, vertical, takeoff, landing aircraft, basically. And so those vehicles making claims that we can put passengers in the air with electric powered vehicles, they actually are not technically proven to work yet. So batteries are extremely heavy, electric motors aren't as efficient as they need to be, and so the, the, all of the calculations to scientifically put them in there, the air don't work. So as a company, we have a team of nearly 50 engineers, very experienced aviation engineers, who look at what's happening. They look at the developments in the marketplace, and then they run away back to their computer desks, and they analyze everything, and they scratch their heads and go, it doesn't work. What they're saying doesn't work. And that's because all we're seeing today is a two-dimensional photograph or a three-dimensional concept of a vehicle that needs proving. And that's part of what I would call invention. And here's a wonderful quote from Helen Frankenthaler that basically says, Invention is about breaking rules or ignoring rules. And that's a lot of what's happening. And that's how we really pioneer a journey towards fulfilling a dream. We invent something. And if you like, today we have what we call disruptors. I would call them inventors, but we like the term disruption. A disruption implies that we're changing a process completely. We're going outside of a framework or rule set. And that doesn't lead to commercial success. That's what we call research and development. And so governments will fund research and development. As a business, we, if we need to attract funding, we need to have a slightly different way of taking an approach to building a flying car. So I would prefer to call that innovation. Here's a quote from innovation. This is another New York CEO, actually, and he's talking about the fact that innovation is simply taking two things that are in existence and turning them into one thing that's functional. And that, to me, in its purest sense, is innovation. And in fact, for Pal V themselves, that's exactly what happened. And I just want to share a quick story with you. If you cast your minds back to 1903, on a beach just near Kitty Hawk in North Carolina, there were two American pioneers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, and their goal was to take some materials that existed at that particular time, put them together, and fly the first aircraft. And that's a pivotal moment in time for us, the point where man flew an aircraft. The difference between them at that time, they didn't have rules or architecture on defining what they would do, but they did stick to known materials that would allow them to complete their mission. What we're seeing today is a little different to that. We're inventing future technology that doesn't exist today and saying, when these motors are good enough, when everything is ready, we can solve a problem. So innovation allows us to take a starting point and a finishing point, which is commercialization, and we have a continuum of development in the middle where we can sit down with a stakeholder or a partner and say, we're at this point on the continuum, and we will arrive at this point and deliver that product to the marketplace. And it's very exciting to be with a very senior company that has taken that approach. And while people may look at the Pal-V and say, but it's not electric, but it's not whatever, the point is it does meet the regulations and we can deliver next year, probably five years ahead of any competition, and probably 15 years before you see flights with electric motors that have any meaningful change in the environment for us. So one of the myths that I want to bust as well is, uh, and the media will talk about this, we're going to relieve traffic congestion. So I've actually had the privilege in the last few days of experiencing Brooklyn traffic congestion. And if you put yourself in that picture and you look at how many cars are jammed up on a highway and take two people from each of those cars and put them in an electric drone that's flying along the street of Brooklyn, you tell me how annoying that sky is going to be above that streetscape. That it, we, we have a hard time really putting rules around an 18-inch drone. We don't like those flying in an urban environment. If we start moving people out there, first of all, it's extremely unsafe. And secondly, those skies will be full if we think we're going to make an impact on traffic congestion. So I actually like some of the stuff that Elon Musk is doing, where we're looking at more rapid transit systems for mass numbers of people. I think flying cars are kind of a cool way to get around, and they're more applicable to solving problems in 
rural areas, allowing people to get to urban areas a little more efficiently, or getting over the top of a very congested area. So once we know where everything fits, it all starts to make sense for us. So if you take a look again at this regulatory framework, really what it means is we can manage uh, risk in our lives if it's predictable. And that's something that the finance markets use a lot. They, they talk about terms systemic risk and unsystemic risk. And one of those is in our ability to manage. We can mitigate certain types of risk. What we can't mitigate is these regulatory frameworks where we need to see a big change. And I think in the future, if I start talking now about the future of flying cars, I absolutely totally believe that we will see these electric vehicles moving people around. And in fact, PAL-V is making some strides in the hybrid marketplace with engines. And at the right time, we'll put that into our vehicles when it's safe to do so. At the right time, when te technology catches up with the flying car, we will embrace the electric engine and we'll start to put those in our vehicles. Today is not the right time. There's a lot more research and invention that needs to go into that particular point. So I absolutely would say, probably in the next 15 years, you will see electric flying cars. And in fact, Airbus is the leader in that marketplace and Airbus is saying that by 2030, they will have commercially solved the problem of electric flying vehicles. So congratulations to you. If you live a little bit longer than I might do, you're going to see electric flying cars, maybe drones. I doubt they're going to be on the streets out there. That is just too complex for the FAA or any regulatory authority to deal with. But we will see them flying around, and they'll solve some problems for us in our lives. At the moment, we've got this. And as I say on here, the path to commercial success implies regulatory conformity. The truth is that with a flying car that complies with regulations, I can sell today and I can deliver to my clients on a promise that next year they will get their vehicles because we know that we meet the regulations. Yes, it's a bit of a nuisance because our clients have to go get a pilot's license. They have to learn to fly. Thank heavens, that's going to make the, the skies just that little bit more safe than putting drones in the sky without pilots that are controlled from a big office somewhere on the earth that I really don't know too much about. I'm not sure I want to sit in one of those drones, but I'll uh, watch the progress and I'll be excited about that. Recently, and I'm very pleased to announce that recently, uh, Frost & Sullivan, who are a very large global market research company, actually did a scan of the flying car marketplace. They looked at all of the innovators, all of the inventors, all of the manufacturers in that marketplace, and they decided to give PAL-V the Innovation Leadership Award for leading the flying car marketplace. So it's not just me here saying that, you know, hurrah, we're doing a good job. Uh, that's been recognized by Frost and Sullivan. And so I think we have a tremendously exciting future ahead of us. Uh, for those Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans in the marketplace, I think the mistake with the electric vehicles at the moment is a little like the Vogon Destructor Fleet, if you remember them. They were designed to remove Earth to make way for a hyperspace bypass, so they designed the fleet, they sent the Vogon Destructor Fleet in, and due to a giant miscalculation in size, the whole fleet was swallowed by a small dog. I think that's a little bit where we are in the electric vehicle marketplace today. I think we need to do a little bit more work, we need to prepare ourselves a bit better for the future, but the future is here and now and today, and we will be delivering flying cars, and you will see these on the streets of New York which is really exciting. It's been a blast. I look forward to chatting to some of you a little later afterwards at the breakout. Thank you.